Welcome to the Real Estate Investor Summit Podcast, coming to you straight from the smallest big town in Texas with your host, mentor, and owner financing master, Mitch, a.k.a. Be The Bank Steven. The possibilities of life without a J-O-B start here. So grab your pen and paper and listen up. Y'all just might figure out how to fail forward to financial freedom. This is Mitch, and you have made it to the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast, and we're going to get you some Tracy Z. Rui today, and she's in the note business. I can't wait for you to talk to her, but first, I got to pay homage to my sponsors. Today's sponsor is MoatNoteServicing.com. Are your collections falling further and further behind because you're too nice? Do you dread those collection calls? Is your account analysis being done each year, or is record keeping just not your forte? If so, let MoatNoteServicing.com stand between you and your payers and all those issues and problems. That's Moat, M-O-A-T, like the moat that goes around the castle. M-O-A-T, NoteServicing.com. That's owned by founder Shannon. Shannon has been 20 years in the note collection business. She has collected tens of thousands of notes. She's licensed and bonded and has made this collection service affordable for you. And she can even show you how to get your payer to pay for the note collection service fee. So how about that, you guys? Free note servicing collection. So contact MoatNoteServicing.com because you should be out making deals. All right. We got... That out of the way, my very nice sponsor, and I appreciate them very much. But we're going to get on to this conversation with Tracy Z. Rui. We're going to get you some Tracy C. Rui right here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, how are you? And all those good things. Well, hey, Mitch. I'm doing well, thanks. I survived Hurricane Matthew out here in Florida, so I can't complain. Today it's beautiful and sunny like it's supposed to be. Well, I'm glad that you're safe and dry and above water. Tell us a little bit about your history so we can catch up with exactly who Tracy Z is. Sure. So I got started in seller finance notes back in 1988, and I'd always been familiar with owner financing. I grew up in a real rural area, so there were a lot of properties that couldn't get any other type of financing. Definitely, I was aware of it. It didn't seem unusual to me for my real estate closing type background, but I didn't get involved in the buying and selling the investing side of it until 1988 when I went to work for an institutional investor. So I moved to the big town, right, the big city out in Washington State of Spokane, Washington, and went to work for a big institutional investor. I started out doing closings for them, and then I got into the underwriting and due diligence, and then somebody showed me a financial calculator, and the light bulbs went off. And um, I headed up their closing department. I helped them go national. Then I was in charge of branches. Then I became the person who was the go-to person for all the securitization, trying to explain common sense approaches to underwriters and securities and all. Although, anyways, it was an interesting time. And I have to tell you, it was like, wow, it was the best way to learn the seller finance note business. And I did that for 10 years. And one of the things that they didn't allow you to do was buy notes for yourself. And that was understandable because, you know, they didn't want you taking deals from them, right? I was intricately involved in a lot of deals, so they didn't want you to have a conflict of interest. So I would buy and sell real estate, and I did buy and sell some real estate with owner financing as well. I did some rehabbing, but I'm telling you, I knew where, the, in my mind, for me, the best place to be was buying and selling the real estate notes themselves, the paper, the, the security, collecting those uh, mailbox payments, as we call them. So after 10 years of working with them, I went out on my own, and that was in 97, and started Diversified Investment Services, and bought and sold notes for myself. And that was just a, a wonderful experience, because now I was working for myself, and it had ups and downs and goods and bads, but investing your own money versus a big company, corporations, is different. We, we can't afford to lose as much, right? Cause so I had to learn and tweak, and I didn't have the same kind of marketing budget they did. So uh, over the years, I've definitely done that. So uh, fast forward now, it's 2016, what I'm getting close to 20 years on my own, and then 10 years doing it for somebody else. So I love the seller finance note business. It's been good to me, and that's sort of my history. Wow, 30 years in the business. I started to chuckle there a little bit. 
when you said it, it was a whole different game when you invest in your own money. <laughs> so you've written this. You're going to give away the 21 tips for investing in real estate notes. And so just so the listeners can get this written down here, you can get this 21 tips for investing in real estate notes from Tracy Z. And that's actually, I think I need to point that out. Tracy Z, that's just the letter Z. That's her real given name. So don't be confused. It's not Z-E-E or Z-E-A or Z-anything. It's just Z, just Tracy Z, Rui, R-E-W-E-Y. But if you go to reinvestorsummit.com forward slash notes, that's plural, N-O-T-E-S, you'll have a chance to get this 21 tips for investing in real estate notes. Make sure you don't capitalize that word notes. It needs to be all lowercase. There seems to be some gremlins about putting capital letters after the dot com forward slash, you want to have all lowercase notes, N-O-T-E-S. So I don't know that we have time to go through a whole 21 list here, but I would like to find out, like, what is the top five ways that you, the best ways to invest in notes or to find notes? I mean, can you give us, like, your top five, Tracy? Yeah, absolutely. So I know that you love owner finance notes, too, and definitely one of the methods is to create your own. As, and I know you talk a lot about that, and that's definitely your specialty. I take a little bit of a different approach, and I go after notes that already exist. So I'm not having to find the properties and buy them and resell them and create a note. I actually go for notes that somebody's already done all the hard work. <laughs> and I well, can. <laughs> I agree ahead. with you. I agree with you. So, you know, it's actually the shortcut to what I do. And I've had people ask me, Mitch, isn't it just easier just to buy notes that other people have created? And I said, in a perfect world, if you can find enough of them, it certainly would shortcut things. I don't know how I got into my niche or why. I feel like I'm more in control of my inventory. I feel yeah. like I can write my paper the way that I want my paper to read with what I need. But Your strategy is great, too, and you have more profit in yours. I mean, if we were to sit here and discuss pro and con, you get to build in more profit in yours. So there are definitely advantages to doing what you do, and a lot of us in the note business do a combination of both. So I'm definitely not knocking it. Just poking fun at myself a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's what I like to say. On this show, my affection, the strategy that I have the most affection for is to buy it with other people's money, go out and own or finance it, and get a down payment and collect payments for a long time. That's my favorite strategy. That doesn't mean it's the strategy for everybody in the planet. And that's why I like to have people like you, Tracy, who come on and show us a different angle and this is really a perfect angle because buying notes and selling notes is not that much different than the owner finance strategy that I use when I'm building the note from the ground up. So I just want to make it clear that what I want my audience to get out of this is their path to financial freedom, whatever turns them on, what they want to do. And so we're very interested to hear your five ways because maybe yeah. the way you do it appeals to someone else when my way doesn't. So. Tell us more about how you've been successful buying and selling notes. Absolutely, and I appreciate the opportunity. So the place that I suggest people to start, unless they already have a background in buying and selling notes, is to earn while you learn. So the simplest step, the strategy one, would be to find a note, refer it to another investor, and earn a referral fee. Now, you're not going to get rich off of that, but you get a whole lot of education, and you're going to earn about 3 to 6%. Probably that's the average fee, 3 to 6% of what the investor invests, you can earn as a referral fee. So that's going to be the simplest way. And like I said, it's going to help you start a marketing method and find notes and get a pipeline and then refer it for a fee. And then you're going to learn the ins and outs of it. So you get to earn while you learn. That would be the first strategy. And then when you're ready, the money, in my opinion, is over investing for interest income. So then when you're ready, you can find a note. You can buy a note, and we always buy notes at a discount, and that discount is determined by the risks, the pros, and the cons of the note. So there you get to set your rate of return. Obviously, it has to be competitive for you to be able to be able to purchase the note because the seller has to have a reason to sell that note at a discount. But investing for interest incomes where your payment comes in and a certain amount goes to principal and interest. So you get that interest, plus you get to earn back your discount because you didn't pay full face value. Can you give us a story or a case study or example of a recent note that you've done? Sure, sure. We like stories. Yeah, stories are good, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> we like stories around here. Tell us a story. Once upon a time, there was this Once guy with a note. Once upon a time. 
All right. So I've got one here from our five ways to cash in and cash flow notes, and that's a free download, too, that they can get when they go to that area that you talked about. Yes, reinvestorsummit.com forward slash notes. Put notes all lowercase. All right. Tell us your story there. All right. (laughs) (laughs) So we do quite a bit of business with mobile homes and land. Not as much mobile home only, although that's great for certain types of investors as well. But here would be, and I usually do a smaller sized example because one, smaller deals spread your risk around. And two, most people say, oh, I could get comfortable with that. And then once you learn that process or that strategy, you can apply it to bigger deals if you want. So this was a well-seasoned note. So again, I work with existing seller finance notes. Now you can apply it as your strategies are creating them, but these are existing ones. So you're marketing to people who already hold a note. So this was a deal in, out in Texas, actually, and it was on a mobile home in land, an older mobile, and the property sold with owner financing for 32500 and they'd only put about 5% down. So the time they came to us, the seller had collected 95 monthly payments, and they wanted to sell all the remaining payments for cash today. So and how many so payments were left? There were only 25 remaining payments left on that one. So the balance had paid all the way down to 8924 and it's some change, and it was payable at 9% interest, and the payment was three ninety two eighty eight a month. So as often the case in these kinds of deals, the payer did have great credit. Surprise, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Surprise. But what it did have going for it was they'd been paying for a long time, and it was an affordable home for them. So did have some delinquent real estate taxes, and then we found out the insurance had lapsed, so things were kind of piling up that it wasn't our favorite deal, and a lot of investors had said no altogether. But we looked at the land-only value in case we looked at paying the delinquent taxes, and we decided to make an offer for that note out of our self-directed retirement account for $2,531. So, you know, we're getting $8,900 balance and we're paying about $2,500. So the seller was tired of all the headaches. They needed the cash. And so they sold it to our retirement account. So if you look just at that as a peer return, you put it into an HP 12C financial calculator, like we teach people to do in our how to calculate cash flows training, is that was a return over 180%. But just a small $2,500 investment that get, would get paid off in... 25 bucks, two, two years in a month. And the great news is we actually actually paid off early on that. We gave them a little discount to pay off early, and so our yield actually went up on that deal. So that's an example of what you can do. Not all of them are going to have that great of return, but there's something you could do with a smaller note. It's harder to get those returns on larger notes, obviously, if they're more conforming types of properties. But those are the types of things you can do with these small notes that some of the bigger investors overlook. Wow, so let's just recap real quick. You negotiated to buy a, what was it, $8,092 or was it $8,900? Uh, it was 8900 It was 8924 and some change. Okay, That's the principal balance. Yeah. yeah, so almost a $9,000 note for $2,500 and some change. It turns out to be a 180% rate of return. But then you went and inspired your note payer of the note that you bought to pay you off early if you'd give them a discount, and they said yes. And so you were able to jump your yield up. How much did you jump your yield up? Do you know, or have you calculated? Oh, I don't have it right here, but I will have to do that for you. I think it was close to over 200 by the time it got done. Wow. So you don't need a lot of money to start off with if you're making 200% yields. (laughs) It'll grow pretty fast on its own, won't it? You know? It will, yeah. I mean, it's not every deal's like that, obviously. I picked a good one, but they're out there. Yeah, well, you've got all different kinds of ranges. I mean, you can't expect to make 200% rate of return every time you walk out the door, but it's nice to know that they're out there. And so what's the next word of advice when we're trying to emulate the success of Tracy Z? So once you get comfortable with notes like that, then you can move into building a portfolio with a self-directed IRA or placing notes with other people's self-directed IRAs or just other people's money in general. We talk a lot about self-directed IRAs because these are great types of investments to put an IRA because they don't require a lot of maintenance like because the payers paying the taxes, the payers paying the insurance. So you're really just collecting or paying a servicing agent, as you mentioned earlier, to collect the payments for you. So they're good for uh, IRA, either a Roth or 
traditional IRA. Either way, they're tax-free or tax-deferred, but they can certainly be bought and sold outside of there as well. So then you move into that and then definitely move into restructuring notes. We just touched on that a little bit, but there are ways to entice payers to pay off early or change the terms that if you put it in a financial calculator, it's going to give you a better return in the end. And then one of my favorite ways, the fifth way, would be partial participation. So we do a lot of work with partial purchases, especially on notes where we might not want to buy the whole thing because the risk is a little bit high. So we'll go in and we'll invest less. And of course, the payer is not going to want to sell everything for that smaller amount, but they can sell a portion of the payments, a portion of time. And that's what we call partial participation. So we do a lot of work. That would be the fifth strategy we use a lot is the partial participation strategies. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that you can buy part of a note. So let's just say there's 180 payments left on a note and you, the person's not all that well seasoned or the property's not worth much more than the balances. So you don't want to take that entire risk yourself and buy the entire note. So you just buy like the next 25 payments or the next 30 payments and for a price. And so a lot of people don't know you can do that. And it's a tremendously smart move because you can invest and hedge your bet at the same time because the note seller is really not going to let you fail in that case if they're owed a lot of money. So they're going to go out and protect you. That's exactly right. So you've got the seller that's still in the deal with you. You've lowered your investment to value. You've bought the portion of the note that's most valuable, which is the more immediate payments rather than the ones way off in the future. And so you're not just having to discount the seller as high, so it's more palatable to them as well. And then there's ways to split up partials. I mean, you don't have to buy all of, like, we might buy 15 years of payments or we might buy 50% of the next 30 years of payments. So there's different ways to split it up. Or we might buy 500 and give 300 to an investor and take the other 200. Or there's all kinds of strategies you can use. You can do wraps where you're sending off the payment to the underlying there's just different strategies to use that all kind of play into that whole partial participation. And that's one of the things that we teach people a lot in how to calculate cash flows is how to run those numbers. I personally love the HP12C. That's what I was taught on. I also use T value. So I was I'm big on making those numbers match up. And T value is nice because you can have a printout to show everybody what happens if the note pays off early, if it goes into default. I mean, there are things that could happen. It's not always going to pay and often does not pay exactly the way the note says it should. Right, but that's one of the reasons I love doing this podcast series here at Real Estate Investor Summit Podcast is because I learn something all the time from the people I'm talking to. And I never thought about buying a note where I get half of each payment or a percentage of each payment. I never thought of that. I always thought it was all of the note or partial on the note, and I didn't know there was all these in-betweens. Which is why we have smart people like you on the call, Tracy. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, well, you know, that they work great when you have somebody that's maybe in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and you say, oh, we're going to buy the next 15 years, but don't worry, you get final 15 years. And they're thinking to themselves, um, and they say it. I mean, you know, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to be around to collect them. And of course, they can go to their heirs, but that doesn't fulfill their immediate needs. So if we split the payment up, then they get some every month, just like we get some every month. And so it fills their needs now. They don't have to wait way off in the future. So... Tracy, I can tell that you are a very creative person. You have a creative mind. I think that's an excellent answer for people who don't think they're going to be around to collect the last payments of their note. I think it's a perfect resolution. You know, I get a lot of students or potential students that want and love the owner finance strategy that I teach and preach. And the problem is they live in areas where houses are just too expensive to really use the owner finance strategy the way that I use it. I deal in affordable homes. I deal in Walmart homes for Walmart people and not the bottom of the bottom, but I deal in the middle range. And owner financing for me works best when the balance that's owed by my payer is 120000 or less. And it really starts to hum when the balance is under 100000 And the lower the balance is, the better my strategy hums along. But some of these people live in places like Los Angeles where a three-bedroom, two-bath house is $550,000. Yeah, it's and, mind-boggling. <laughs> yes. And so that they're real intrigued with this owner finance strategy. And the reason why I'm bringing Tracy Z here is because here's a strategy that you can use from anywhere in the planet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Do you see all these houses that you buy notes on? 
No, rarely do I see them. You know, if they're local, definitely I would. But um, no, you can send out somebody to do a BPO, broker's price opinion, or drive-by appraisal before you purchase it. If I'm buying a mobile home only without land, then I do like to stay closer to home and go see them. But if it's got some dirt attached to it, the real estate or a stick-built home or anything like that, no, a lot of notes can be bought long distance. Yeah, so I think this is a perfect strategy for people that understand and appreciate the investment that has a solid physical collateral piece attached to it that you can substantiate a value on. And I think it works perfectly. Now, how do you deal with all the different states? Do they have different laws? Is it, are there states that you like to do this in and states you don't like to do it in? Or Yeah, well, I used to buy in all 50 states. And then I got smart and I simplified my life. And now I mostly buy closer to home. But you certainly can, but you do need to check the laws of your state. There are a couple of states like California that says if you're going to advertise um, that you broker notes or you, you buy and sell notes that you have to have a real estate broker's license. So I stay away from those. Typically, unless I'm in California, I wanted to get a real estate agent's license. But most states, for the most part, don't have laws that say you have to be licensed to be an investor to buy the note or even to refer the note for a fee. But you definitely want to check what the laws of the state you're going to do business in. You know, I'm not an attorney, and I don't know the laws of all 50 states, but most of our students haven't had any issues there, especially if they're looking to buy notes for themselves. So, yeah, you want to understand. But the rest of it's pretty much real estate law, right? So it's it's mortgage law, real estate law. So you're buying, you're taking an assignment of a mortgage or a deed of trust. Those are the most two most traditionals. You're getting the original note. You're getting it endorsed. That's one of the things in my 21 tips is know the process and hire experts to help you. It's usually going to be a title company that will do the closing. But you want to make sure you get that original, you get it endorsed, and you check the different things on our due diligence checklist. You make sure taxes are current and the property is insured if it has a building on it. And the basic things that you would think to do, we always talk to the payor to make sure they're happy with the property, try to get a verifiable payment history. It's not that we won't buy the notes if any of those things come up with a glitch. It's just that our offer is going to be different or perhaps going to be lower or it might be structured as a partial. So just make sure that you understand those tips or you're hiring somebody that does a good job to do the due diligence for you. And there are companies in our directory that will also, you can hire out to perform that for you if you like. Yes. Well, you have just a ton of resources, I bet. So the first thing, you said a whole mouthful there. So I'm, I did. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm I, guilty I was, of that. I was, I was just jotting. <laughs> well, no, that's good. That means you're enthusiastic and passionate and you know your stuff. So we really don't have scripts around here because the people that we're talking to, they live this life. They don't need a script. And yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we bounce a little bit because of, but let's break it down here for a second. One Absolutely. of the things you said was you got smart and you started picking certain areas. I think this is probably, and I want you to affirm or, or recant, when you localize where you're trying to buy notes, either by state or by county or whatever, you're actually being able to brand yourself more effectively, right, than trying to shotgun all over the United States because that's a big job. Is that one of the reasons why you started to tighten up your area or your region? Yep. Yep. That is definitely one of the reasons. You can become known as the local expert and you also get more in tune with what's going on. And you also can get a lot of deals based off of referrals that way. So your marketing budgets go down. So there's several good reasons for doing that. And I feel that most people, given a choice, they'd like to do business locally. Now, if your price is comparable and your service is good, then they'd rather do business with somebody locally. So that kind of gives you a leg up because there is quite a bit of competition if you decide to go nationally and do direct mail and some and online advertising. It's, it's a lot of competition. So one of the ways you can set yourself apart is to be your local expert. By being local, you also could have the same resources that you go back to time and time again and not have to find a different resource for every different market. Your resources would start to be able to be used over and over again instead of having to find a new resource every time you find a note in a different state or something, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay, and you also said, and I don't know if the listeners caught it, you talked about people in California, if they wanted to buy notes, that they had to have a broker's license or a real estate agent's license, but that's if they buy notes in California, right? Can a Californian buy houses in Texas, for example, without... Because I know in Texas, you don't have to have a broker's license or real estate license to buy and trade notes. So a Californian can go to a state where they don't have to have a license and they can start investing there, right? 
My understanding is yes, but I'm not an attorney and I don't play one on TV, but my understanding is yes and and I've seen people do it and it, I, the issue is that if you're advertising you buy and sell notes in California then they notice that and ask for that. But if you're an investor in California buying in a state that doesn't have any of those types of rules or regs, then yeah, as far as I know, and we've done it ourselves, it's not a problem. Okay, and like she said, we are not attorneys and we're not CPAs. These are our own personal opinions. You take them for better or for worse and make sure that you substantiate the kind of business, the location of where you want to do business with your attorneys because it just makes sense. I mean, if you're going to get in the business, you got to become somewhat of an, an expert, and if you're not the end-all expert, then you got to hire an attorney or someone to explain to you exactly what the rules and regs are. But once you get it, you get it, and then you're off and running. So I want to ask you maybe like two big questions. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? And the reason why I ask this is because we both know and everyone should know that there is risk involved, and let's just talk about your biggest nightmare that ever happened, and we'll get that off the table, and, and then how to avoid that in the future. <laughs> yeah, well, when I went out on my own, I started buying notes. I bought a deal where at closing we found out the insurance had lapped, the hazard insurance. That happened to us a lot in closing when I worked for a big company. And they had the wherewithal and they had these forced place insurance policies and blanket insurance policies. And we would just buy and then we'd force place or we'd make people bring their insurance current. But I got to closing. A lot of pressure. There's a lot of, there was, you know, the seller really needed the money. It became a personal story. And so I knew I should have stopped the closing and made them get the proof of insurance. The plan was to get the forced place insurance on Monday. We closed on a Friday. And guess what happened over the weekend? What? <laughs> the property burned down. A lot of people <laughs> would think that that's, oh my gosh, I just got zeroed out. But guess what? You still had the land, right? Yeah, absolutely. So now you go to plan B and we still had the land, but the land was not as the same value as what was owed on the note. And the payer tried to figure it all out and get it right, but they had a wife who was terminally ill and there's all sorts of sad stories. Things happen sadly in life with people and they just were not able to find a way to make payments on a piece of land that no longer had a home to live in. I mean, fortunately, everybody was safe and alive, but understandably, you know, their motivation to make payments and their ability to make payments had gone away. So they wanted to not pay anymore, and so we took the property with closure. So now we started marketing the property. So, Tracy, to put all this into context, give us the numbers. How much did you pay for the note, and what was the value of the property before it burned down? And then when it burnt down, what kind of predicament were you in by the numbers? Okay. I'm pulling them up here. So this was uh, actually in Oregon. It was like a 1940s bungalow style home. And this is actually the details of it are a part of our blog that we share with people. Seller had sold it for 45000 The buyers put five down. They'd carry back a note of 40000 When we bought it, there was about 37000 and some change owed on the balance. And we were in at about 31250 So that's what we'd paid for the note. So it should have been worth about 45000 It hadn't appreciated or gone down much amount of time. I think a couple of years of payments had been made when we bought it. So excuse me. No, I'm looking here at our notes. The fair market value at the time we bought the note was uh, $60,000. So that was due to appreciation at the time. But most of the time, we would just go off the $45,000 sales price. So you got this house, fair market value, somewhere around sixty. You paid 35000 for a note. And then it burns down and you're left with just the land. What was the yeah. land worth or how were you, what were you able to salvage out of this? Well, we got a land only value that said it was about 24 to 29,000 land only. Of course, this was after the fact, not before the fact, which is part of what the lesson I'm learning here, right? Yes, yes. You learned, you learned to size up what the land is worth just in case. Yes. Well, especially if you're going to allow it to close without an insurance policy. If it had insurance, it would have been no problem. So if we back up a minute, the big problem was we closed without making them put that insurance current because if it had happened, then the insurance company would have paid us off as lost payee as the mortgagee. So that would have been no problem. That's why the insurance is there. But because the insurance wasn't there, now you're just stuck with this land only value. And the next problem we had on it was that it was going to cost quite a bit to get rid of the building because the building didn't burn down all the way. So we did two very creative things. And at the time I had this wonderful woman working with us who is our processor, and I still miss her to this day. But she says, hey, 
my husband does volunteer fire department stuff, and they're always looking for buildings to practice on. We don't know anybody there. We were in Washington State at the time, but she goes, let's call the volunteer fire department and see if they will use it as a practice lot and burn the rest of it down and save us about $5,000 in in cost to get all the debris gone because it was becoming a hazard with the debris there. And the county was not happy. And so anyway, so that's what we did. We contacted the fire department and they did a burn <laughs> on the property as a practice. So that saved us about $5,000 in the cleanup costs on the property. So then we started marketing the property. We had the property owner next door who had a very nice $250,000 home. One of those areas where you have a really nice home here and then you could have a small house here and then over here maybe a mobile home. So they gave us a lowball offer. And so they made a $10,000 as-is offer to purchase the lot next to their home. Yeah. <laughs> Did you take that? Or I imagine you could have got more for the lot if you owner financed it to someone else. But was that the case or not? So what we did was we talked to him about how, you know, that was too low and what we had into it. We'd like to at least get out whole. If that wasn't acceptable to him, we'd have people who contacted us about maybe putting a mobile home on the lot. <laughs> uh-huh. A little, a little, uh, a little, uh, if you don't, I will. <laughs> So they brought their offer up a little bit, and at the end of the day, I think we were out about somewhere between five and ten thousand dollars on that deal. But to have only lost uh, ten thousand, which could have been something much worse, that was my lesson that I learned: that don't get pressured into closing when you know that you shouldn't. I tend to a little bit get involved with the personal side of people's stories, and you definitely have to remove yourself from that situation and say, "These are my due diligence items." And this is what I require and just hold firm to that. And also look at getting forced place insurance or getting a blanket policy that will protect you. There are other things that if you're going to take those chances, I mean, who would have thought that it would have burned over over the weekend? So so definitely have your due diligence checklist items. Don't waver from that unless the deal, you have an out that makes economical sense if the worst case scenario does happen. Okay, so again, a mouthful here, and let's just, I want to reconfirm the mistake that you've made is a mistake that I've made several times, and it takes a little while to bolster up and not let that happen again sometimes. Because when you start getting involved in the personal stories and the cancer stories and the life and death situations or the sob stories, this is when I've made my worst deals too. I'm a very compassionate person. I feel for these people. And you have to learn to remove yourself from the emotional side of these deals and do what's right for your company. Your company doesn't have any emotion. It has a bottom line, and your job is to um, protect that bottom line. And you have to take the emotion out of it. So great lesson here Tracy's bringing up is be careful when you start getting emotionally involved because this leads me to my next little tidbit you'll want to be sure to write down is, and this person that Tracy was dealing with, I don't feel like or it doesn't sound like, they were cons. It sounds like it was just a circumstance in very bad timing. Even in a couple of days later, you would have had insurance, but it burned down on the next day. And so I want to appraise you all of something that I've learned to recognize, the four signs of a con. And so the four signs of a con are, first and foremost, they always give themselves a noble facade. They are a minister. They are a priest. They are a marine. They are a policeman. They are someone of high regard, and that's the facade that they'll they'll give you that they are this kind of person. One of the second sign is they need to close extremely fast, personal and emotional reasons. And they always that brings you to the third sign is they'll try to they're appealing to your compassion, they're appealing to your compassion of why you should move fast to help them. And the very last sign is there is very good or extremely good potential profit for you or your business in this transaction if you would accommodate them. Those are the four signs you need to look for. When those four signs line up, start slowing down, start pulling back, and start focusing really heavy on your due diligence because this is the four signs of a con. Noble face, big profit, an emotional story, and the need to close fast. When you see all of those things line up, buyer beware. Start slowing down and backing up. What do you think of those four indicators, Tracy? I highly endorse that. I think you could do a whole podcast just on that. I think those, you've boiled it down to a nutshell. Yes. 
And then in my book, My Life in a Thousand Houses, Failing Forward to Financial Freedom, I did get conned uh, twice by two cons, and I was able to con the con back. And they're very interesting stories. They're called uh, Conning the Con Number One and Conning the Con Number Two. They're in the stories towards the end of the book there. So if you're interested in how I conned the con back and got made whole, then you'll find that story very interesting. But I will tell you this. When you're trying to get your money back from a con and you've already lost control, you have to appeal to their greed. Mm -hmm. And you can get back in and sometimes undo what's been done if you'll appeal to their greed from a third-party position unbeknownst to them. So I'll let you read the stories to figure out just exactly what I said and what that means. Boy, now we talked about a bad thing that happened. The sequel to that question was, what's the best deal you've ever done, Tracy? What? Tell me your the victory that you're still trying to surpass. <laughs> Well, you know what? I am kind of careful investor. So like I just like doing I like to watch and repeat those little deals like I talked about early on with the normally they're the 15 to 20 percent yield, not 180 percent. But I like to watch and repeat those kinds of deals. One of the, my favorite stories, though, and it's on our blog as well. You know, I call it the church note. It's where we bought a partial. We bought a full and we sold a partial to an investor and then we kept the back end. So we made like a thousand or two thousand dollars at closing and then we actually owned the back end of a note and it was a sizable back end. And then the note paid off early and we got a nice big mailbox check. That's one of my favorites because it was a deal we did without putting in any of our own money. About what was that check worth to you, that last sizable note? Can you give us a number? More or less. Yeah, so that note, let me just pull up the numbers here. So we had a in seller that had a note on a church. And you can read all the details of the funny background story of buying notes <laughs> on church properties. But needless to say, we decided it wasn't a note we wanted to buy, but we would be happy to broker it to another investor who didn't mind buying notes secured or paid by churches. So we had sold that note to the investor at closing, and we kept a back end. So the seller sold all of it, the investor bought a partial, and we kept payments in the future. So we made a small fee at closing, and then we had this residual income. We were supposed to get the last approximately 15 years of payments. And so the wonderful thing about that was we didn't actually have any dollars invested in that deal. So we made some money at closing, and obviously we had some time and energy invested, and then we kept the back end. So this deal ended up paying off. Quite a few years went by, and then the deal paid off. And so we got a payoff check for a residual interest of around $57,000. And that was like mailbox money, right? So that was a wonderful, that was one of our best deals that we did where we didn't even have to invest any money. And if you try to put that into a financial calculator, you have to at least put a dollar in there because it says error five. It says you can't make that much money without investing anything. (laughs) Yeah, it's infinity or something. So you made a couple thousand when you sold the note. And I'm going to guess you didn't. I'm going to guess here. But yeah. you don't want to do notes with churches because you don't want to get yourself in a position to have to foreclose on a church. Is that why you don't do it? <laughs> yeah, I say there's several reasons that I personally don't, but other investors will. One, it's a special use type of property. So if you do get the note back, it's a little bit harder to sell. Number two, verifying income is kind of tough. I mean, I say that pastor runs off with the organist next week. I don't think the parishioners are going to be donating very much. And so how are they going to make their payments? And then the third reason is, no matter what your beliefs are, I just don't want to be the person who had to foreclose on a church. <laughs> I don't want to... Absolutely. So, <laughs> so you made a couple thousand when you pawned off those issues to someone who didn't care about those issues. And then a few years went by, and they paid off, and you made, say, 57000 So it was a $59,000 turnaround kind of money from heaven, if we can use that. Oh, <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> money from heaven. You know, they were lucky enough to pay, be able to pay off their note, and the pastor hadn't run off with the organist yet, so they, they <laughs> had made enough money to pay off the note. And I think those are all great and valid points. And I just want to say again, Tracy is a very creative person who knows her business inside and out. If you're going to go into this business or any business, you should have a mentor to help you avoid all these little nuances that you can't possibly know until you live through some of them. Tracy's lived through a ton of these instances. She's been in the business over 30 years, 10 years with some with another company, and 20 years on her own. So you know that she's seen a lot of things happen, a lot of things good and a lot of things bad. And so 
to go into a note buying business and not have the benefit of a person like Tracy is to me just the definition of insanity. Why would you go want to learn all these lessons on your own? I know that mentorship sometimes costs and to some people they seem very expensive. Ten thousand, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand. I know people charging fifty thousand and a hundred thousand. But when you compare this to a college degree and what you get when you walk out of those doors and you compare the kind of money that you can make and the fact that you don't have to look for a job, you're creating your own job, and that there's potential to make money if you don't make mistakes. Here's the thing about mentorships. You can measure a mentorship by its success by how much money you make, and it's very easy to say, well, this mentorship was worth it because I paid X and I got back X plus. But what you can't calculate is how much money did that mentor keep you from losing? Because if they've kept you from losing, then you'll never know how much money you would have lost if you did not have their tutorial skill. And so I'm just saying no matter what genre you want to go into, you should hire someone who's been there before, who is in a position that you wish that you were in or want to be in in the future, and you've substantiated that they're real and that they've actually done what they say they've done and that they're, on another hand, a good mentor, is meaning they actually take the time and make sure that they give you the resources and the FaceTime or the phone time or whatever you agree to. Make sure that the people are getting that time and they're happy with it. And so I want to thank you, Tracy, for coming on. I don't think we could have had a better podcast about notes because I think you're just hitting everything right on the, the head of the nail there. So. I appreciate you being on. Again, go to reinvestorsummit.com forward slash notes. Make sure you put notes in all lowercase. And you'll get the 21 tips for investing in real estate notes right there. And I suppose you're going to find a whole lot more when you start looking into Tracy and all the free stuff she has to offer and all the advice. And then you can consider her course or her mentorship. I think you'd be a, a better person for it if this is the business that you're going to go into. So anything else we missed or anything we need to cover that I haven't covered, Tracy? No, and I appreciate very much that you had me on the call today. Thank you. It's it's great. We've had a lot of our students that bought notes that wanted to go into creating notes locally that have also worked with you and have been very happy with your class as well. I see what we do is very compatible. We're in the same industry. We just come at it from different angles. And um, one of my big passions right now that I touched on is I'm want everybody to learn how to use a financial calculator. And everybody gets scared when they talk about calculations and numbers. And so I take it and break it down easy. I'm not a math major, but I do understand money, especially when it's I want how to make it and put it in your pocket. And so we have a very affordable $97 training course that I just kind of did because I wanted people to not be afraid to learn how to use an HP 12C and understand the time value of money. Because if you're going to buy and sell notes, You're leaving money on the table if you don't know how to use that calculator. So that's kind of been my passion in the last year, in addition to teach people to buy and sell notes themselves. But really, you know, let's demystify how you use a calculator and how to run calculations in our business. So that's kind of one thing I just wanted to mention to people, no matter even if they're not buying and selling notes, if they're just wanting to know how to finance a car and get a good deal. I mean, you that all those things, you need to know how to use financial calculator because nobody minds your money like you. Exactly. And I do want to say that in my strategy, I just use a cash on cash rate of return, which is a very simple formula. Your annual income divided by your investment, hit the percent key and get your percentage rate of return. So I deal on a cash on cash, very simple formula, just trying to keep it simple. But if you're going to be in the note buying business, it's extremely important that you learn how to use those financial calculators. And I think to pay $97 to learn how to use one, (laughs) If you can't figure out how to get your $97 back after you learn how to use one, maybe you should go into a different business because with Tracy's help (laughs) and that calculator, you should be able to make your $97 back. And with that being said, Tracy, I want to thank you for coming on the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast. And please tell your friends, you can go to reinvestorsummit.com and you can see all the podcasts. Please tell your friends. Please share the podcast link till we meet again. I want to thank you, Tracy, and I hope you have a great year this year. Thanks. You too, Mitch. Bye now. Bye. You've been listening to the owner financing master, Mitch Be the Bank Stephen, on the Real Estate Investor Summit podcast. Let us now blatantly, without apology, bribe you towards financial freedom by offering you 
a whole bunch of free stuff. Go to reinvestorsummit.com and get you some. And you all come back now, you hear? <laughs>